So welcome everyone to the SOMA workshop, SOMA, from Policy to Program Workshop at CEJAS Congreso 2020, Rising Up for a Just Recovery. Uh, I'm your MC, Ernesto Revalo with Communities for a Better Environment. And in this one hour interactive workshop, we'll learn about the SOMA program. And I am so excited personally for this one because my first Congreso as a member and volunteer with CBE was when AB 693 uh, was one of the things we were speaking to our elected officials about. And I was um, one of the folks who presented on AB 693 in my group. So it's, it's really great to now see the implementation of this really, uh, like one of the SEHA led um, programs that we have. So I pass it off to Gwen and this great group of facilitators that you'll have for the next hour. Thank you so much, Ernesto. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's incredible um, that advocates like yourself um, from the 2015 Congresso to now are still with us today. Um, I just wanted to let that kind of sink in a little bit because I think as advocates, we're always trying to find ways of moving forward, thinking about, you know, what's the next issue that needs our voices. Um, and sometimes we don't get the chance to really celebrate like what we've already built. Um, and half a decade ago, the same folks, the same organizations that are here with us today were advocating for SOMA and it just passed its first full year of implementation. And we're just as much a part of that process as we were five years ago. And I don't think many groups can say that they've seen a policy through its life cycle the way that um, we have. And I think that's just an amazing testament to the power of our communities when we do come together, um, which is why we're here today to not only talk about the benefits of SOMA, but to also share how to replicate this model for other programs in the future um, to help bring a just recovery. So before we get started, if folks um, want to introduce themselves in the chat, um, please put your name, um, your pronouns, and what your favorite fruit is. Um, we'll know the drill. And you'll also see a poll pop up asking if you've heard of SOMA before. So while you're chatting that in, um, go ahead and quickly answer that poll. Um, and while we do that, we will have our facilitators introduce themselves as well. Um, next slide, please. Hi, all. My name is Aisha. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently in Redwood City, but I work for the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, and we have members in Oakland and Richmond, and my favorite fruit is mango. Hello, this is Therese Sanago. I uh, work with Communities for a Better Environment. I use she, her, they, them. I work in the Southeast LA region and live in Long Beach, and I like peaches. Hey all, my name is Monica De La Cruz, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the summer coordinator at Environmental Health Coalition, or EHC, and I'm down in San Diego. My favorite fruit is guava. Um, and I am Gwen. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the curriculum and outreach manager at SEHA, which you all know um, represents EJ communities across the state of California. Um, and together, APEN, CBE, EHC, and SEHA, we make up the community-based organizations um, that help do tenant and community outreach, popular education development, and workshops for the SEHA, or for the SOMA program. Um, and our goal as a group is to continue advancing equity within the program design and ensure that our community voices are being represented in the implementation processes as well. Um, and so let's take a look at those poll results. Um, it looks like about half a 50-50 split of folks who have heard of SOMA or who haven't, but whether you have or haven't, um, we'll be going through the basics of the program, as you can see on the agenda, um, and hopefully everyone will be able to take something away. Um, and just as a reminder, we will be breaking out into small groups. So if you would prefer to be in a Spanish speaking breakout room, please remember to put a one in front of your name. And with that, I will hand it over to Monica. Thanks. 
So really great to see those poll results. Um, for whom SOMA is brand new, we're so glad you're here. Uh, the SOMA on, or sorry, the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, or SOMA, uh, is a program that addresses the pre-existing conditions in communities disproportionately affected by environmental racism. It's a program that touches on housing, energy, and our workforce, all systems that are influenced by faulty institutions. SOMA is a program that was born from years of advocacy by our community at spaces like Congreso. I want to shout out to all the advocates attending this session. Um, if anyone on the call participated in Congreso back in 2015 or advocated for this funding in your communities, thank you. Of course, we're gathering during a time of crisis. Uh, we're here at Congreso this year uh, to discuss how we envision a just recovery. What do our communities need from a fair, equitable recovery? What kinds of opportunities? What kind of environment? What kind of resources? A just recovery, what we need to see, means that we are at the front lines in creating solutions for ourselves, right here in our community. The investor-owned utility companies haven't taken a break during the COVID shutdown. They're still making money off us staying at home and using energy, and they're making more money um, with polluting energy sources that we know are hurting our health. So we must recover by getting back to work in jobs that are healthy for our community and help us decrease our dependence on dirty fuel. Right now, COVID-19's uh, disproportionate health and economic impacts are highlighting the longstanding uh, structural inequalities and environmental racism that we experience in the backdrop of our everyday lives. These inequalities exist because of discriminatory policies that perpetuate white supremacy. Just for one example, policies redlining exclude people of color from owning homes and uh, building credit and wealth through property ownership, which then affected generations of Americans. This becomes a huge barrier to clean energy adoption, as most families who are renters in EJ communities don't have the resources or authority to install their own solar PV panels on their rooftop. As a result, we see far fewer or far less uh, renewable energy adoption in our communities who stand to benefit the most uh, from cleaner, less expensive power in their homes. Environmental racism exists in policy and practices. We can observe the policy decisions made by city planners perpetuating incompatible land use, the policies of divestment from affordable housing and social safety nets leading to housing insecurity. Um, and the policies of cap and trade enabling polluting industry. But policy like the creation of the SOMA program can also support a just recovery from these impacts. SOMA's program design is based in the understanding that EJ communities have higher pollution burden and less access to the benefits of renewable energy. It plays a part in a just recovery and addresses some of the larger issues we've touched on by distributing resources, specifically access to solar technology, savings, and jobs. And for that, I'll pass it back to Glenn, give more information. Thank you so much for that context, Monica. Um, with all of that in mind, um, we wanted to share a short video that was created by APEN that goes into the history of the advocacy and the benefits of the program as well. California is often seen as an environmental leader across the nation and the world for its initiatives to mitigate climate change and promote renewable energy. But many of its environmental efforts have not been equitable. When you look specifically at residential solar, only 6% can be found in disadvantaged communities, despite the fact that these communities make up 25% of California's population. In this disparity, we have a huge opportunity to bring solar to those most impacted by fossil fuels, giving them a chance to access the benefits of the renewable energy economy that have been so long out of reach. How can we ensure that our transition to a clean energy future includes everyone? In 2011, SEHA introduced the idea of energy equity through a statewide initiative to allocate a large investment towards bringing solar to disadvantaged communities. After years of advocacy that put SEHA on the map, it created the conditions for CalSEA, SEHA, and other community-based organizations to come together around AB 693 
that was then passed in 2015. AB 693 became SOMA, and the process of bringing energy equity into disadvantaged communities had begun. What is SOMA and who benefits from it? SOMA stands for Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing. It is a program under AB 693 that will fully fund solar panels on low-income renters and disadvantaged communities across California. Once implemented, SOMA secures $1 billion over the next 10 years to fully fund solar system installation, making it one of the largest low-income solar programs in the country. With more than 420,000 apartments eligible for free solar under SOMA, it seeks to ensure that California's new clean energy economy is accessible to disadvantaged and low-income communities too. The implementation of solar power would reduce energy bills, increase employment benefits for local communities, and ensure that at least 51% of energy saving benefits go to tenants. The Asian Pacific Environmental Network Richmond Community Leader, Lipo, says, Richmond has been suffering from Chevron's pollution for over 100 years. Clean energy created by Assembly Bill 693, the SOMA program, will not only benefit our energy bills, but also our health and the environment. This is the largest investment in accessible solar in U.S. history. SOMA is a bold, significant, transformative program that will create equitable change in the industry, in our environment, and in our community. Um, um, I loved the, I love like the fun stop motion um, way that the video was animated. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the program and go into the benefits, but before we dive into that, um, I wanted to provide some background of just how the SOMA program is structured. Uh, it's administered by four nonprofits, uh, Grid Alternatives, AEA, Center for Sustainable Energy and the California Housing Partnership. And they coordinate with stakeholders um, like contractors, property owners, and utility companies. And so where we fit into the program um, as CBOs is we're the community element and we do a lot of the direct community outreach and education um, for uh, the tenants and community members. Uh, we're the direct link between our communities and the groups that are administering it, which gives us the really unique opportunity to continue shaping the program through community perspectives. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so as the video mentioned, we know that um, in the places where we organize, where we live, a large percentage of environmental justice community members live in apartments or multifamily homes um, that in the past have not had access to um, solar technology. And so SOMA, the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, um, is designed to bring solar to our communities um, and provide direct solar energy savings, uh, which help renters save on monthly electricity bills. And just from what we've seen with this pandemic, um, we know that we need the savings more than ever now. Um, SOMA actually requires that 51% of energy savings go towards tenants or renters. Um, but of the 32,000 tenants that are being served by our program right now, actually 90% of the savings are going towards benefiting renters, which is a lot more than what the program requires. Um, and shows that the incentive model for SOMA is working to benefit and prioritize savings for our communities. Um, another major intention of the SOMA program is to bring sustained economic growth to our communities through paid job training opportunities. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that it is paid, um, something that I know we all fought for um, like as part of this program. Um, and 48% of our prospective job trainees on the job training portal uh, live in our EJ communities. 
Um, and so of the 700 opportunities that are available, 26% um, um, or approximately 180 of these opportunities are located within our communities as well. Um, so with that brief overview of year one, Soma, I wanted to hand it off to Trez and Aisha for the next section. Awesome, thanks Glenn. Um, so yeah, we'll be moving into a skills building section where we'd like to discuss elements of the SOMA program that you might be able to use in your own work. Uh, I'd like to rem remind you to use the chat if you have comments or questions and we'll do our best to keep up with those. Uh, also, thank you for your introductions. Um, it's great to see uh, where we're all coming from, such a wide variety of fruits that we like. And um, I saw a couple land acknowledgements, so definitely appreciate that to identify uh, the indigenous people whose lands we occupy. So yeah, moving into skills building. Sorry, next Sorry. slide, please. Great. Um, so first up is the use of Cal Enviro screen. So as we mentioned, this tool helps figure out if a building is eligible for a SOMA installation. It's used by policy advocates and implementers to help identify areas that are most affected by pollution. Cal Enviro screen uses things called indicators, which create different ways to measure the burdens different communities face. Some of the indicators include things like proximity to waste sites, levels of unemployment and rates of asthma. This tool can be used in policy and implementation spaces to specifically resource those most affected by environmental racism and other socioeconomic factors. Well, another uh, important element of implementation of the SOMA program is budget for capacity building at our community-based organizations and our integration into the implementation process. Uh, so as CBOs in EJ communities, we often have more issues to address and assets to develop than we have time and funds for. Uh, we commonly refer to these as issues of capacity. So our participation in implementing the SOMA program depended on program dollars uh, dedicated for uh, dedicated implementation staff. Uh, next slide, please. So as Glenn mentioned, uh, this, this is sort of the structure of the SOMA program administrative team. Um, so we have these four large um, housing and energy nonprofits, and then we're managed, the CBOs are managed by grid alternatives. Um, so having this structure and having CBOs integrated into the program administrative team, we found was the most effective way of maintaining our program engagement after the bill was passed, 8693. And uh, this dedicated staff is important because our role is uh, to do the relationship building and the movement building on the ground in our communities. And so for programs established by policy, uh, it's often important to have stipulated capacity for implementation. And so for the SOMA program specifically, 10% of overall program funds are dedicated to administration, uh, which includes uh, the work of the program administrative team and the CBOs, and 90% of the funds are dedicated towards the solar projects themselves. And so anchoring local outreach with CBOs has helped center our community needs and decision-making processes during implementation. Great, next is our CBO involvement in program feedback. So historically, even with programs that do center equity in their plans, oftentimes they can fail to do so because of a disconnect with the communities meant to benefit. So some of the roles that you saw on the previous slide with the PA structure diagram, are filled by people that live outside of California. So CBOs play a really valuable role on the ground. We have a great deal of feedback, um, provide a great deal of feedback throughout the SOMA program's creation and rollout in order to ensure equity. The feedback is given at many different levels from the content that's used to educate our members to any changes to the actual rules of the program that affect stakeholders. Our role also helps the program be responsive as injustices our community face heightens and allows us to draw intersections between energy programs to our environmental justice goals. An example of this was seen with the growing anti-Asian racism during COVID. Our role as CBOs allowed us to raise issues tenants may be facing in this moment to the program administration team. 
Right. And um, because we live and work in our communities every day, um, we, including everybody who is in Congreso today, uh, we are the experts on our community's needs. And this perspective is important to bring to implementation spaces. So this is also why we have a network of CBOs across California that are working locally to uphold um, our local concerns that our communities face. So uh, if you're able to see the slide, this is a photo of one of our quarterly summits uh, where the members of the program administrative team um, and the community-based organizations come together uh, once a quarter. Now those are virtual, um, but this is just an example of um, how it's important to create space to discuss um, and understand community needs. So programs, um, like Aisha mentioned, programs are often designed with narrow sets of goals and not a lot of room for flexibility to adapt to community needs. Uh, we came up against this in our first year of implementation. Um, we were facing uh, wildfires, power shutoffs, um, electricity rate hikes, and now a global pandemic. Um, and so it's been very important that programs uh, that are designed for communities have the flexibility to adapt to situations that arise and that we're able to communicate with our communities about what's most important to them at that moment. So programs that address um, our programs for our community should be able to address these throughout outreach and popular education because otherwise critical connections between people are missed. So to gain this flexibility, we've had to offer education uh, to the SOMA public administrator, um, program administrator to better understand our community's circumstances, our assets, our needs, and how we work as CBOs. And some of the ways that with this education were through a toxic tour of East Oakland, an introductory workshop on the concept of just transition, and through sustained dialogue of emerging community needs uh, with the SOMA program administrator. Uh, this also requires a commitment from the SOMA PA and CBOs to create space for these conversations. All right, and lastly is shaping the emergency response. Um, during the program. So within our COVID response work, we've tried our best to uplift tenant and job trainee benefits and protections. For example, with the SOMA program job trainee portion, we've had multiple conversations around the safety for workers on SOMA construction sites and trying to ensure that the program centers effective best practices for construction safety during COVID. An example of this is hosting a job trainee protections workshop for all the contractors that are affiliated with the program so that they're up to date with standards and procedures. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that overview of how the program has been structured. Um, before we break out into our small group discussions, um, we wanted to pause for to give everyone a chance to chat um, your questions into the chat box. Um, we will have Therese and Yadira who will be helping look through these. Um, so we just wanted to give the next five minutes uh, for that. And if, if you do have a question that we don't get to, please take down our contact information at the end of this session. Um, you can reach out to any of us and we'd be happy to connect and um, answer your question. Oh, so I'm seeing the first question is, will CBO or will SOMA work with CCAs? Um, so it is part of the program design that um, uh, be buildings that get their electricity or utilities through CCAs um, still qualify for the SOMA program. Yep. Uh, thank you, Sheena, for dropping that in the chat. So um, CBO stands for Community-Based Organization. Uh, there was a question, does some of us incorporate battery storage? Um, so not at this point. It's something that we're working on, um, definitely as an element of um, energy resilience. Uh, are there things we should be advocating for to improve or expand SOMA? Definitely. So uh, we can talk more about this in our small groups as well. But um, just off the top of my head, a couple of things are um, equity within the job training process. So um, at this 
point. Uh, we are seeing that a large number or a large proportion of the job training opportunities are in uh, what are considered disadvantaged communities by Cal Virus Green, what we consider EJ communities. Um, however, it's not really written into the policy that um, local and targeted job hiring um, is required. Uh, so things like that. But we can talk more about that in small groups. I'm seeing another question from Mariana about um, what's what has been our virtual engagement look like during COVID. Um, so we, like every other program, have switched towards um, having everything be virtual. So a lot of our workshops are kind of like how this is right now, um, hosted over Zoom. Um, but typically, we are trying to be as engaging as possible um, with different activities. And um, yeah, if folks want to give examples of some things that they've done. So yeah, I guess, um, for example, we've, um, in our previous, we've done small group, small group breakouts, um, and we've given out gift cards so folks can have lunch, so similar to how Congresso has been for everyone, um, using the annotation feature so that folks can draw. Uh, that's another way that um, we're trying to keep communities engaged. So a question, um, how do residents um, engage in the job training? Um, so one uh, element that we're happy about with the SOMA program is that if you live in a building uh, that's receiving a SOMA uh, pro project installation, um, as a resident, uh, you're eligible, if you meet the contractor's hiring requirements, uh, you're eligible for the job training opportunity. Otherwise, uh, you would need to be currently enrolled in um, a relevant educational program or have graduated from one in the last 12 months. Um, so there is a little bit more flexibility for the residents of a building um, that's participating in SOMA. Um, and they would uh, connect with uh, the online job training portal. Um, I, Gwen, Monica, Aisha, we could support folks uh, with connecting to that as well. And uh, Rebecca had a question, how could best practices from the summer program design be applied to other clean energy initiatives like transportation electrification? Uh, so this is kind of exactly what we'll be talking about in small groups is uh, translating some of the elements of the program. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, we'll talk about kind of what values um, the programs are based in and how decisions are made to center community needs. So I think that's overall like um, a main way that we could translate uh, some of the, the things that work well in the summer program to other energy initiatives. I think there was a question about, um, if I understand it correctly, um, when someone is unable to pay their electricity bill. Um, so there, we also do kind of a complementary engagement on with the SOMA program about um, energy savings assistance programs, um, other things that could help communities um, save on their electricity. So definitely, um, we'll have our contact information at the end of the presentation. You can definitely reach out if you have a specific question. I think we have maybe one more minute for questions. Uh, I see a couple of questions about regionally and uh, how to qualify. Um, and so the program is specifically for um, buildings in investor-owned utility territories. So that's SoCal Edison, PG&E, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, Liberty, and Pacificor. Um, so unfortunately, at this point, if you're outside of those uh, utility territories, 
they're not eligible for the SOMA program, but within those, um, if you uh, reside in a multi-family building of five units or more, each of those units uh, must be individually metered. So you can measure the electricity that's being consumed um, by each uh, apartment or dwelling. Um, there are a couple other specifics, but um, at the end of the day, it is the property owner who applies for the program. And so uh, what we like to do is engage property owners um, in our communities to get them engaged in the program, get them enrolled, and do education with the tenants uh, so that they know um, all the benefits that they could receive and potentially get involved in the job training. Awesome. So um, as you, as, as we go through this presentation, there will still be chances for us to um, ask questions. We're going to go into small breakout rooms now. So if there are still questions that you have or that come up for you, um, feel free to ask them in these breakout rooms. Um, and also we will have uh, our contact information at the end. Cool, so now we'll get into our small groups uh, for about 14, 15 minutes to discuss how SOMA and uh, similar programs connect to just recovery. So our group facilitators are me, Therese, uh, Gwen, Monica, Aisha, Jose, and Alexis. Um, and so once you get into your group, um, your facilitator will let you know who they are. Um, and they will give you the question that you'll be discussing in your group. Um, as soon as you get into your group, please designate one person to provide a report back when we return to the main room. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in about 10 seconds or less, I am going to open out breakout rooms. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen, it's not there right now, but at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see um, a big square that consists of four little squares that says join breakout room. If you're on a cell phone, you're going to click on the three dots and then you're going to click join breakout rooms. At this time, all breakout rooms have opened. Go ahead and click join. So once again, at this time, we've opened up all breakout rooms. Please look to the bottom of your screen. You should see a square that says join breakout rooms. Please go ahead and click that. Please raise your hand and come off video if you need any support, and we will reach out to you directly. Looks like we still have a, quite a few folks that haven't joined the breakout rooms. And BK, are you in the English channel? I am. We don't have an interpreter in here so if you don't mind interpreting sure if there's maybe someone else who speaks spanish um uh al bajo de la pantalla hay un cuadro de cuatro cuadros que dice salas de breakout puede se puede poner uh or haz click en la, el cuadro de breakout room para entrar La, la discusión de grupos pequeños.
Alicia Briceno, uh, quisieras uh, entrar un, un grupo? Estela también. No sé si le gustaría entrar en discusión de grupo pequeño. Um, sí me puede mandar al grupo de español, por favor. Sí. Um, al bajo de la pantalla. ¿Está, está usted en computadora? O, uh, sí, computadora. Ok, si miras al bajo de la pantalla, hay un, dice John Brown? Uh, hay un cuadro de breakout rooms. Ajá. Uh -huh. Y lo, lo haz clic en el breakout room para entrar. Además, a veces si uh, se mueve, se mueve las um, las ventanas en su en su pantana ven, eh, en su pantalla se puede ver un, un cuadro que dice join breakout room yeah she got it I think BK, there's probably quite a few folks that are maybe on the call, but doing other things right now. Since I see a lot of good. Do you want me to join the Aisha's room and, and come back or I can pop sure. in and check in on folks? Okay, great.
Hey, BK. Hey. Um, so that room was all set. Um, Eddie just asked if he can be co-host. I thought he was co-host. Yeah. What room is Eddie in? I'm not sure. Um, um, I think it's fine. It could probably wait for a while back. I think so too. Yeah. Did you check one room? And I, yeah, I bounced around a little bit and everyone seems to be doing oh, well. Oh, great. Awesome. Okay. I'll go ahead and go back to Aisha's room to check it out. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Glad to have everybody Glad back. Everybody I hope back. that the conversations in your breakout room were fruitful and visionary. We'll go around to each group and hear their top two points that they discuss. I know that you all probably had more than two points, but we kindly ask that we keep everybody's report to one minute if you can, just for the sake of time. So just to get us started off, um, Jose, if you can share um, some thoughts from your conversation. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, I think a lot of our members wanted to keep discussing the topic and wanted more okay, information about Soma. Oh, sorry, can you all hear me now? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, our members uh, wanted to learn more about Soma and um, just the topic of uh, renewable energy um, and kind of how to qualify and, and what it means. Uh, but yeah, some of our members definitely brought up um, you know, the potential savings, uh, the, the importance. Let me just get my headphones are not functioning. So let me see. No, I can I, hear. You all hear me better now? Yeah, yeah. I, I can hear. You? Yeah, you. Let's see. That was okay. Yeah. I can hear too. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to summarize that, then, uh, you know, and some folks talked about, the infrastructure differences, right? And, and some cities having old infrastructure and the need to improve and renovate old infrastructure, uh, especially now uh, thinking about that. Um, the difference in, in savings and energy savings, right? Someone mentioned that they knew some folks that had solar in San Francisco that maybe had a smaller savings than fo folks in Sacramento. So just thinking about how we can you know, serve different areas and different climates, I think was part of a conversation. And just the idea of educating everyone on how to think about their utility and and 
how to discuss these topics because I think there is definitely a, a want to to learn more and 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 they see the potential right the group that we were talking sees the potential of, of renewable energy and, and its benefits. Thanks so much, uh, Glenn. If you're ready, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll I'll give a quick summary of what our group talked about and if folks um, from my group wanted add in for anything, um, feel free to. But um, a lot of what we ended up just starting to get into um, was that it's harmful for our communities to have these privately controlled um, utilities and really wanting to have more of a model of community ownership of um, things that are really essential that we're seeing like electricity is essential for us to be able to be connected, um, to keep the lights on, and um, to stay cool in the summer if we're in really hot areas as well. And so having that be a community controlled resource um, rather than um, controlled by like um, investor owned utilities, for example, like PG&E. Um, it was also mentioned, you know, the question was also brought up of like, you know, why aren't resources and funding flowing to programs um, that we actually need and that will be helping to support um, our communities. And that's that's sort of a question that I think uh, we all have um, with regard to like, where's the funding coming from? How can we get programs into our communities that actually help um, address those issues? Um, so yeah, those are just a couple of the points that we talked through. Thanks. Um, from my group, the time went by so quickly. Yeah, but definitely uh, we, we talked a bit about how um, everybody really has their part in, in creating a just recovery, um, how those who are at the front lines should be leading in the solution as well, um, and that it's personal, continuing to do our work, whether it's volunteering or, um, you know, in any way that we can, but definitely uh, that uh, a lot of it rests on education to get uh, people motivated. Sometimes they just don't know enough about what the consequences are, um, but uh, once they learn about it, they wanna do something more, especially with kids. Um, we had one volunteer share about their work in community garden and getting um, a really like hands-on personal um, relation to um, uh, the earth, the soil, the and um, right now, especially as kids are out of school and especially teens who are then preparing to enter the workforce um, and their schools change completely, what is going to be their future? Um, it's so important that we get kids motivated um, in this movement. And um, next up, we have Teresa's group. Yep, and I think Amanda is sharing. I don't know if Amanda's there, if I'm having audio issues, but um, I could share for our group. So we were discussing um, how to get your community's needs prioritized um, in decision-making processes. Uh, some things that came up, we talked about some local uh, policies and programs that folks are working on. Uh, some things that came up were the importance of understanding um, the fundamental causes of um, the environmental racism that we experience and addressing those fundamental causes instead of um, having false solutions that often um, you know, don't really help our communities or put us in a worse situation. Uh, we also talked about the importance of getting specific, so uh, really identifying our priorities and our needs um, to be able to communicate those and advocate for those specifics. Um, I don't know if Amanda is able to speak, if you have anything that I missed. She said her computer restarted, Tedis. Sorry. Cool. Okay. For the sake of time, I think we'll need to move on, but if um, Aisha's group is ready to go, yourself off. Yeah, I have Gina from my group sharing. Okay, awesome, Gina. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
So our group uh, sort of went over um, just to have a shared def definition of a just recovery and um, to just review what SOMA, how SOMA is increasing access to, um, to solar for those who aren't necessarily homeowners um, and, and how that connects to the environmental justice movement. And, I, and we sort of went over some um, needs that were coming up during COVID. And so I think um, similar, uh, in, in similar um, comments to what Gwen's group had mentioned that um, this idea of um, like having, I think this idea of community ownership um, in terms of uh, resources that are, that are um, important and, and needed for the community in terms of um, bridging the digital divide. So um, Arlene from our group mentioned that it was, it's, it was difficult to reach out to um, community before school started, but the, that school sort of gave the impetus to connect virtually, um, but there's still um, issues of Wi-Fi access. Um, and that, you know, that sort of connects back to, I think the utilities piece and, and um, the, the sort of like, um, like what, yeah, what does community owned resources uh, look like, which we didn't necessarily get to um, go into, but I think sort of speaks on that piece. And I think one of the um, solutions that uh, was shared out, um, that Arlene shared out was also that um, they would create animated videos um, to familiarize um, the public with a program or a project before doing flyering or or actually knocking on doors. Um, so being able to um, prep folks beforehand um, and sort of find a solution to the, a, a little bit of this um, uh, barrier to to um, community engagement um, right now. And so that's um, I think some of the um, some of the points that, that that were shared in our group. And if there's anything else that um, someone was, wanted to mention that uh, wasn't able to speak, because I know it, <laughs> it was a short amount of time, um, feel free to chime in. Thanks, Gina. Um, can Alexis's group go next? Sure, we have uh, Sheena speaking for us. Yeah, um, our group also really focused on uh, a just recovery and kind of um, defining that and seeing um, or lifting up the needs that we're seeing um, for just recovery, not just for COVID, but um, really tying it to a lot of the historic um, issues that have been facing our communities. Um, so I think that there was a recognition that things have been um, really bad for a long time. And now we're seeing, you know, those our, our communities hit by pollution are also hardest hit by the pandemic. And so really wanting to see um, more effort, um, more programs like SOMA, but more effort from the government to like really prioritize things that address both um, environmental injustice and um, yeah, just like health injustice, health for people and communities. Um, and also some recognition um, that there's a lot of like misinformation or um, that kind of the, the way that um, the government has like deprioritized or neglected our communities can show up in times like these when um, maybe people aren't, you know, wearing their masks or respecting social distancing. So there's just like um, a lot of care needed for our most vulnerable that's, um, true for like our, our system and our government, but also like um, a culture that we need to build up um, around us as well. Um, yeah, those were the main things, I think, unless anyone else wants to add. Monica, I don't think we can hear you. Sorry, thanks so much. I was just about to say, I think we're at time to start wrapping it up. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Great. 
Um, thank you all for taking the time to join us in conversation. And we've covered a lot today from the benefits of the SOMA program, our role as CBOs, to the tips for replicating aspects um, that best ensure just recovery in our community. So feel free to contact any of us directly. We have our emails all linked out here or check out the Cal SOMA website as well for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. If we can just leave that up, because I know there's a couple of folks in the chat that do want this information, but a uh, special thank you to Aisha, Therese, um, Monica, Gwen, and uh, facil uh, some support facilitators of, of Jose and Alexis for this great SOMA workshop. If everyone can share appreciation. Uh, we're going to take a, a quick uh, break before the Just Recovery Workshop at 11.15 a.m. And so I hope that you are getting some rest, um, looking at the virtual photo booth, and um, checking out um, the, uh, the, the virtual photo booth, taking pictures together. Um, one thing that I do wanna uplift for everyone is that we do have uh, the Facebook for SEHA of at California Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, where you can share all of your lovely pictures of, from today. And then we also have at SEHA Power uh, on, on, in, on everything else. That's Instagram on, and Twitter. So you can continue to share out um, all of the lovely pictures that you take with the virtual photo booth uh, with the hashtag Congreso 2020 and hashtag Just Recovery. And with that, we're going to get into some great music again from DJ Quemadre. Thank you so much. We'll be back at 11.15. Olive woman's eyes, wala makaka tiki. Brown, brown woman rising, I mean, ang yung kukat. They got nothing on us. Nothing on us. Nothing on us. Nothing on us. Olive woman eyes, wala makaka tiki. Brown, brown woman rising, I mean, ang yung kukat. They got nothing on us. Nothing on us. Nothing on us. It's so bugsaw. Story arc if it don't involve no matrix box and mothers work in the crowd up they craft in air like ATR with the butterfly sleeves I'm a Philippine gun I'm a big silly time I'm a fan of the god I want to talk up for I'm a god 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 I'm a